Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. On today's show, we welcome back Jonathan Posey from the Council for Holistic Health Educators, an organization that every health coach ought to be aware of. Jonathan advocates for us, particularly in states where the legislation threatens our ability to help our clients achieve healthy behavior and lifestyle outcomes. Many health coaches we speak to are confused and overwhelmed as to what they can legally do in their state or region. Jonathan is the go-to resource for this information. But before we dive into the show, I really want to take this moment to encourage you to fight for your right as a health coach. If you're feeling stymied by what feels like draconian scope of practice regulations where you live, stand up. Join the Council of Holistic Health Educators and lobby for your right to practice. We would love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. And by the way, the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Our show is proudly brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute, now an accredited educational provider with the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches. This means that our graduates can become eligible to sit for the NBHWC credentialing exam to become a board certified health and wellness coach. Check out primalhealthcoach.com slash level two to learn about our new advanced coaching course taught by me that will nudge you out of your comfort zone, launch you into coaching mastery, and qualify you to sit for the board certification exam. Laura will share a little bit more about what we teach and how at the end of today's episode. We like catching up with Jonathan at least once a year so we can keep our fingers on the pulse of what the heck is going on. And nobody's got a pulse on the health coaching situation. Quite like today's guest, please welcome Jonathan Posey. All right, Jonathan Posey, welcome back to Health Coach Radio. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm okay, all things considered. I've been exposed to COVID, but I'm I'm okay. I'm doing okay. Got my water, got my vitamins, got my supplements. I'm good. Oh my gosh. Getting some vitamin D from the window there. That's That's really important for COVID. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, my, I even, my doctor was impressed because my D3 is up to 72. Ooh, and he said, yeah. anything above 50 is great for COVID and, and you're at like 72. So good. All right. That's yeah. awesome. So thank you for coming back. We wanted to just sort of revisit with you. I know that there was a lot of action on the legislative front last year or this just this past year. Um, so, but before we kick off, let's remind everybody who you are, and um, what the Council for Holistic Health Educators is all about, why you started it, and kind of your mission um, moving forward. So go ahead and kick us off. So the Council for Holistic Health Educators is a nonprofit, is the only nonprofit advocacy organization that is out there fighting on behalf of holistic health schools, practitioners, and our various stakeholders. I founded it in kind of late 2016. Uh, I was uh, marooned at a a very poorly run nonprofit that was really making my my ethical and legal uh, antennas wiggle. And I just like, I have to get out of here before we all go to jail. And so I, I started thinking about what could I do? And at the time I was in Atlanta and there really wasn't a lot that you can do for government relations. Well, my girlfriend came to me one day and she's a, she was a nutritional therapy practitioner and Mm -hmm. a very good one. And she said, honey, um, yeah, I can't practice here in Georgia. And I said, what do you mean you can't practice here in Georgia? She says, well, uh, the law says that only someone with a license can provide any type of food, diet, or nutrition services. And the only person who can get that license is a dietitian. And I thought for a second, I was just like, my, my first gut instinct was that's really dumb. (laughs) <laughs> and I could understand on some level that that could be a problem, but you could just go down to the bookstore and, and probably find enough information to kill everyone. So right. why do we need this state issued license? And so just that idea that there was this area of healthcare that had become so, and so ubiquitous 
in today's society, something that we are all following and tracking and can understand, it just seems very anachronistic and asinine to continue on with this license. Uh, it really upset me that, that people could not work. Mm -hmm. They could not build a business. They could not follow their career. Uh, and so I thought, well, we, let's see what we can do about it. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized that at the time and, and uh, in 2016, going into 2017, there was no one fighting for our rights as the holistic health community. We were constantly depending on other communities, mm -hmm. uh, other organizations to carry the water for us. And so I just thought, light bulb, we've got to create our own trade association. We've got to try to unite the different types of schools, the different modalities, the different practitioners, because uh, if we don't, we're just going to get divided and conquered. And so since then, when we started in January of 2017, that was kind of our official start date for everything. There were 21 states in the District of Columbia that required a license. Today, there's only 16. Wow. And I'm hoping by the end of, end of next year, there'll only be 14. And we're going to keep whittling them down until there's zero. And that's, how, and that's, where we, that's how we got today. Amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing this work and for coming to our rescue. Um, so you mentioned so the Holistic Council um, advocates for schools, modalities, and practitioners. How, so, so it's not just at the practitioner level, not, not yeah. just, but I think that's pretty cool. So tell us how you work with schools. I mean, this is a bit of a self-serving question because the school we work <laughs> for is very, we're very, we just, we love what you're doing. So we're one of the investing schools, but how, how do you work with schools? So well, schools, it's funny. So schools, um, to be frank, schools are the only ones that really have the money to put behind something like this. Yeah. Uh, a lot of practitioners are stretched pretty thin, mm -hmm. uh, especially those just coming out of the program uh, in their first five years, they're building their business, they're having to pay for insurance, business license. Um, there's a lot of things that make them really uncertain uh, about those first five years. And so when I first looked at it, I thought, oh gosh, well, we've got I don't know, 50,000 practitioners across America, 50,000 health coaches. Surely if each person gives $100, this will be a gangbusters uh, organization. And it just didn't turn out to be that way. There was, there was just, you know, folks in Colorado didn't see that they needed to support anyone in Florida because Colorado is mm -hmm. fine. Why care about Florida? Mm -hmm. And so I went to the schools and, and Primal was one of our first, I think, who was like, yeah, this is fantastic because we need someone who can look out for our graduates, look out for our students. And we're not just one of those schools saying, oh yeah, there's so many job opportunities out there. You're gonna have a blast and make a ton of money. Yeah. It's that, yes, you're gonna do great, but, and we're gonna train you to be great, but this is how we're gonna protect you going forward and protect your investment in our school and in our modality. Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. that's, the way I work with schools is, is it's just, it's interesting because the way I work with schools is sort of twofold. On the one hand, they provide the bulk of the funding that keeps the council going, keeps our work going. But on the other hand, what I also do is that from the very beginning, again, based on that, based on the lessons I learned from that nonprofit in Atlanta, you can't just say to someone, give me money and trust me. Right. Yeah. I hate that. I hate that. So what I decided to do early on was say, okay, what is... What's the value? What is the value that I can give back to the schools while they wait for me to change these yeah. laws? Because it can take up to a year. Mm -hmm. And for that the thing I came up with is to provide the individualized support. So any alumni, no matter when they graduated, any student and any prospective student of a member school can call me or email me and I will do whatever I can to assuage their concerns, help answer their questions, go through the law with them uh, help develop a scope of practice if they want it. Yeah. They know I've made a good investment and I'm not going to wind up on the end graduating to have some lawyer I just right. paid $10,000 to say, yep, you got to have a license. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. grateful to that. And, and in fact, one of the first things you did for us was a series of webinars that explained scope of practice to health coaches because, man, people get worried. <laughs> people get really worried. Mm -hmm. Like, can I yeah. actually legally do this? Yeah. And, and it, it, you, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, but I've spent the past 15 years of my life writing law. So I like to say I write law. I don't, art, I don't defend them in court. And in writing the laws, uh, and by that, I mean, anyone can just look at the law. You don't need specialized training to read law. And, and so when you read it, 
and you start to think about, okay, it says I need a license, but then there are all these loopholes right. to fit into. For example, you can always educate, recommend, and inform about dietary supplements, no matter where you're at. You can always sell dietary supplements, no matter where you're at. You know, you can always provide that general health and wellness information, guidance, education, the stuff that everybody knows, where it becomes a problem is when you're working one-on-one. And right. even then, it's just, we have to change the way we talk. Because as much as the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics tries, they can't take away our right to free speech. And so exactly. that's, that's what we're working on. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, so I moved to Florida, you know, this, I started in Illinois and I recently moved to Florida. And part of what um, got me excited to finally make that decision on Florida's was when the state law changed, thanks to your efforts and uh, the people that uh, lobbied to help you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did recall at one point looking at the state law that looked super strict. And then very quietly, I noticed a change in the language <laughs> that, this, so this is before the, the law actually changed, but a change in the language around just give public speaking, right? And being able to give a workshop and speak to that. That is that is the sort of, you can't take away my right to free speech, I think nod that was originally made, but now we have a governor here in Florida that wants to deregulate and, um, you know, kudos to you and the team and everyone who supported you to jump on that, which makes, yeah. so maybe not, maybe this is a good time to transition into kind of, I don't know, I guess tooting your horn a little bit and talking a little bit about some of the positive changes that you guys helped affect this year. Well, we were very, very lucky. So I, we've been working on Florida for three years, mm-hmm. uh, maybe even longer. If you go back to some of the work that was done in, in 2016 and 15 by various organizations and the, the problem with Florida is that the Dietetics Council was a softer version of the mafia. <laughs> they would engage in undercover stings. They mm-hmm. would steal people's trash. They would try to get wiretaps. Uh, they would really go crazy to try to trap practitioners. They would ask loaded questions in public. They would call up and ask loaded questions and try to get you to slip up so that they could report you. And for a long time, the, the academy had a contest that you could win $500 by reporting an unlicensed practitioner. Wow. And, and so Florida was just a really nasty state's play in. And so at the end of 2018, uh, a very brave, courageous woman named Heather Del Castillo had moved from California, where she had a thriving health coaching business, and she moved down to Pensacola. And she wasn't there more than a, a couple of months before she had an undercover investigator come to her. And as I understand it, she violated the law by saying, so Laura, tell me, what do you like to eat? What do you don't like to eat? That's a nutritional assessment. And she's just violated the law. So she got served with a letter, uh, $700 and something dollar fine. Um, But the Institute for Justice stepped up and said, wait, this is crazy. So they sued the state of Florida. And that lawsuit is still going. The state of Florida is still paying to fight this lawsuit. Um, And it's going to continue to go forward because even though we were successful earlier this year with actually passing a law uh, that explicitly exempts unlicensed practitioners for providing food, diet, nutrition, assessment, guidance, information, education to individuals. That was key. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're still pushing forward on this lawsuit because quite frankly, IJ just wants to take, they want to take down the entire law. And I say, go for it. Um, So we were very, very fortunate in that down there in Florida. Um, and I think we, we benefited because we caught them a little flat footed. Mm. Uh, we had the legislation come into the house representatives and we had, we didn't have any opposition. It was really strange. It wasn't until it was passed the house and halfway through the Senate that all of a sudden, uh, the Florida dietetics council said, "Uh Oh, uh, and started shoveling money towards lobbyists. Uh, we had them, oh gosh, we had them accusing us of creating a public health crisis. And it has nothing to do about healthcare. That's the funny part. And, and I'm still sticking with Florida. I haven't even talked about the other states. This is just about Florida. The former president of the Academy, Lucille Bessler, she made a wonderful video called Watching the Disruptors. Right. I encourage everyone to Google that. And she makes out, she lays out the official case for the Academy. It's not about healthcare. It's about people disrupting the way they do business. It's about money. It's about market share. 
And I'll never forget watching the debate, the last final debate after it passed the House, passed the Senate, it came back to the House for a final vote. The sponsor, Representative Blaze Angolia, I saw his staffer hand a piece of paper to him. And I saw, hey, that's my logo. That's our logo for the council. And he started reading the talking points. And one of the talking points was, there's 25 million people in the state of Florida. There's only 5,000 registered dietitians. There's no way they can possibly see even half of those people. Right. Even if they were seeing them every half hour on the hour, you know, 52 weeks a year. And I think that really moved people in this direction of thinking, yeah, it's nice that dietitians do what they do. And there's a lot of great dietitians, but they're not everything. And there are other people who are just as trained, just as qualified to, to do that basic handholding. Yeah. Meaning, hey, John, yeah. you're looking a little hefty there, buddy. Let's make you some re recipes so we can lower your calorie count. You know, you may have been exposed to COVID. Great. Let me provide you with some foods that are going to reinforce the vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, and the other things that you're going to need to fend off that COVID. You know, being able to do that for someone, even though you're not, you're not diagnosing a disease, you're not curing a disease, you're not treating a disease, you're just helping me feel better and ward off bad things. I think that really sunk in with folks out there. So Florida, huge victory. Yeah. Uh, and they're still attacking us. They're still attacking us. As soon as we got that exemption, they decided to start attacking us on lab testing. Mm -hmm. That's like just that, how it yeah. is. And so, so without, you know, so, so what happened is that just a couple of weeks ago, they had their November board meeting, their fourth quarter board meeting, and they had a little workshop on lab testing. And they didn't really talk about restricting or dangers. They really kind of focused on just getting themselves the ability to order lab tests and be able to work with the results. Uh, and so they did vote to do that and they sent it to the uh, medical board of Florida to approve it, uh, which is really just a rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. But I do perceive and, and what I'm paid to do, but unfortunately because it's Florida, I, I'm, uh, I can't deny anything that this time next year, I do believe we're going to see uh, licensed dietitians of Florida saying, lab tests are killing people. There are people out there who don't know what they're doing. They are ordering these lab tests. They're filling their clients with heads with all this information they don't know how to process and people are dying. And they're filling them, they're shoveling them with, with dietary supplements from Kathmandu that they have no idea what's in them. It's just like, guys, come on. Yeah. Perdula. It's It's so frustrating. Um, so, I mean, well, this right there, I guess it's, it's to, to something that you had said about how, you know, why would somebody who lives in Colorado that doesn't have these problems mm -hmm. want to donate money to an organization like you to support somebody in Florida or some other state? And my answer to that would be because you never friggin' know what's going to happen in Colorado. All you need is a change in legislature. You just need a, a new governor well, or a new well, Senate that, that, um, like errors on the side of regulation to totally change the game for you. Not even that, not even that. Why, so call, and it is, it is a dirty little secret of our industry that when you look at who donates to these kinds of things, who responds to action alerts, who gets involved, it is very much a, we have a lot of folks who stick their head in the sand. Mm -hmm. say, oh, that'll never happen in Arizona. Well, Oregon, Oregon oh. 2017, came up with an emergency legislation to require to have a mandatory registry of all unlicensed health and wellness practitioners. And I thought well, that no lists yeah. mandatory lists have never worked well in history. We don't want one in Oregon. Well, that was 17. We defeated it very quickly. Well, it came back and it's back now and legislation is coming in January. It's being drafted right now. And it is coming in January, which will lay out a voluntary registry. Okay, it's a voluntary registry. And the way they define who qualifies is that basically if you help someone feel better, you can be on the registry. Well, you the can that, be on the registry. You can be. Well, no, it gets worse. We'll let you. It's like, yes, you can sign up for our voluntary registry because it protects consumers to know who these people are and where they are. Well, it's being pushed by this nutty organization called MACBO, which I don't even, I don't even quite understand the, the acronym, but it's a private nonprofit organization that 
to get on the registry, you have to pay MACBO a fee every year. And so when you think about who in the world is pushing a registry, because remember, they want it to be mandatory. They don't want it to be voluntary. Mm -hmm. They want a mandatory registry because of the mandatory registry. They can then say, okay, we have 10,000 practitioners on this mandatory registry. It's time we start enforcing some standards because that's good for the public health. So let's, right. everyone should have at least a college degree, right? Well, that's 30% of the people who now are forbidden to work because it's a mandatory registry. And if you can't register, you don't have a college degree, forget it. Okay, you know, we need to make sure that people not only have a college degree, but that the, the education they received is in dietetics, nutrition, uh, uh, and, and diet. So if you've got a business degree, sorry, I got a political science degree, I'm out. You know, if you've been practicing as a health coach for 25 years, sorry, you're out. Yeah. Little by little, it becomes a boa constrictor. Um, but it is, so this is the Mental Health and Addiction Certification Board of Oregon. And the way they make money is overseeing licensure and registry programs for the state of Oregon. That's how they make money. And so their mm -hmm. lobbyists are pushing hard to, to open a new revenue stream. You know, and I, I get nervous about stuff like that too, because I, I, I shared this in the last time we had a conversation, but I was chased down by the dietetics council in where I live. Um, Physically? Because so, they've done that too. <laughs> fortunately, no, they, it was digital and I was very compliant. So <laughs> they didn't shake me down <laughs> in person, <laughs> but um, like they, they were like, I, at first when I got the first email, I was like, oh, okay. They're just kind of fanning out. And, but they had like a dedicated person on me and they said, you have three days to change the wording on your website. And I did, I did it. And they said, you missed a, you missed a spot. You, you say it, you say the, you know, the wrong word here too. So I had to kind of go through and change things. So when I hear about lists like this, it's like, well, they're just making a list of people to go and chase out. Targets. Yeah. To like to justify their existence. Yeah. You know, if you look at, so the state of Maine last year, uh, enacted a safe harbor law, and the safe harbor law um, is a it's a weird it's a funky kind of law because if it's done right, it works great, and if it's done right, it says, Aaron, so long as you do not diagnose, treat, or attempt to cure a medical condition, you don't use any type of protected titles, and you don't attempt to practice medicine, have at it. That's it. Well, the yeah. reason they were able to do that in Maine is because for like three years a bunch of legislators had been trying to get rid of the dietetics board because they discovered they never met. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I found out that the same thing in Georgia, the executive director for the dietetics board in Georgia uh, sat next to a colleague of mine at a conference in Savannah. And she just started complaining that I can't get anyone to show up for the meetings. I really want to retire and get away from this, but I can't find anyone to take my place. We never meet. And it's like, huh, well, maybe the legislature should hear about that so they can dissolve the board because why have it? Why spend yeah. the money adding it? I, um, you know, if this just, but it's just maddening. I want to get to the good news. I want to get back to like the yay, <laughs> the good news. But, but the other thing that I also think is important to say, just for health coaches listening, and this is just my own opinion, but I want to know who else out there in listener land agrees. Like, I don't want to diagnose, treat, or prescribe. I have right. no interest in doing that. I didn't, right. I don't want to be a doctor. So I just like whenever people talk about oh, it's dangerous and it's you know scary, for, let these unlicensed health coaches go out and do stuff. It's like literally, how, tell me how it's scary because even I had to deal with that with the. Uh, I pushed back a little with the dietetics council here. I said, "What's the issue, guys?" Like I replied back to that email and said, "What's the issue?" Well, it's dangerous. I'm like, I've helped. I've have got 600 clients under my belt who are in better health than they've ever been yeah. in their life. How, I. Don't, like, I don't understand where the danger is. Tell me where the where danger is. It, Aaron? I'm in Alberta, Canada. Okay. Well, so Canada has some interesting uh, uh, laws. A lot of their laws are pretty open, as long as you don't use any kind of protected titles. Yeah. But down here in the States, I don't know about Canada, but in the States, dietitians were never meant to be in private practice. Mm -hmm. right. They are, have always been institutional people. Yeah. In prisons, schools, hospitals, where they create menus and they monitor meal plans and, and that. Well, then the academy in the 80s came up with the registered dietitian credential. And they had to find a way to get people to buy it. Because why, why pay for a credential, a third-party credential, if you don't need it? Right. 
you know, our community, our holistic community has these third party credentials out there, these board certifications that, you know, it's great if you're marketing and it's great to say, hey, I'm board certified. Yeah. It doesn't get you anything. Right. So why keep paying for it? Is my, is, is kind of how I'm and And I know that's kind of a very, I don't know, a narrow way of looking at it, but I'm just thinking why? And so in order to convince people to sign up and get the registered dietitian credential is they had to add value. Mm -hmm. And the way they added value was they started going around making it so that you had to have a license. And in order to get the license, you have to have the RD credential. And so it just becomes a revenue stream. And when when your whole entire organization is dependent upon that revenue stream, you're going to fight like crazy. So there is no way in God's green, blue, brown earth that the dietitians are ever going to say, you know, holistic practitioners actually have a place in this, in in, in the field of of healthcare. That holistic practitioners and health coaches could do some good because it immediately undercuts their whole argument. So frustrating. and, and, And through the 80s, as they got more RDs, suddenly RDs are like, well, I'm tired of working in schools, hospitals, and right. I want to go private practice. Yeah. I want to be able to build insurance. Well, that requires a license. And so it just became a cash cow that just, yeah. And so I'm slowly bleeding them. And I, like I said, I've got them down from 21 states in DC to 16 states in DC. Uh, they, just, they just failed again for like the 10th year in a row in Pennsylvania. Oh, so, tell us about that. So, so we, got, we got Florida. Right. Um, what else? What, 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 let's let's get focus on some good news. What else good happened in this past year? We got North Carolina. Yeah, yeah, that's that was, right. That was a huge multi-year thing that that would not have happened, but not for us. Mm-hmm. It's very critical. What had happened was very similar to what happened to Aaron. There was a guy named Steve Cooksey back in 2015 who had a website. He was just a blogger. He wasn't a practitioner at all. He was just a blogger. Uh, he called himself the Diabetes Warrior. Hmm. because he was on all these medications he had diabetes and through his own edification he got himself off of those medications conquered his diabetes and he felt great so we wanted to share that good news nope north carolina board of dietetics said you cannot even talk to your friends over the phone about food and nutrition without a license so our good friends at the institute for justice sued the state of north carolina uh, and the state lost and the state had to issue some guidance, but they eventually had to rewrite the law. Well, the problem is, is that they were not going to push to have the law rewritten. Mm-hmm. That wasn't their job. You know, they say, hey, the law needs to be rewritten. If you don't like it, you can sue the state again. So I came in and I said, wait, you mean nobody's pushing this law? And what we had was two senators, one senator in particular, who's just like, until I hear from some of these think tanks about deregulation, I'm not comfortable moving forward. And my first question to the various people who at the time were working on was, has anybody ever called these groups? No. So I picked up the phone and started calling. And by the end of it, I had over 60 health coaches and holistic practitioners in Raleigh, in the Capitol, lobbying. And they, right after they approved funding for the Woolly Worm Festival, they voted on, on the legislation to give us an exemption. It would never have happened without us, yeah. ever. And so this year, and then we conquered Maine. Maine uh, was what Maine was not our doing, by the way. Maine was a a group of herbologists uh, Mm -hmm. who just decided we want to fix this. So I can't take credit for Maine, but I can take credit for Pennsylvania. This year in Pennsylvania, the dietitians were, were, we want a license. We we, we need this license. Um, And and if you saw some of the details and language they were using, they really backed themselves into a corner. Uh, And so we finally got to, I think, a couple of months ago where the dietitians went on their hands and knees to the legislature and said, well, what do you want? Please, what do you want? And so they came back to us and I said, you know what? Here's what I want. I want there to be an exemption that a license is not required unless the employer requires it, unless it's a hospital or the employer requires it, which is a little limiting because we'd love to be able to work in hospitals, but let's give them that. Let's see what they think. Right. They wouldn't agree to it. They wouldn't agree to it. So the legislators, legislators are like, okay, guys, you got to go back, go back, go back home and rethink your whole game plan. Cause this seems very reasonable. And it was Wednesday of last week that it became clear that the legislature did not have enough working days left in the year to pass the law. So we won. we ran out the clock and we won. It's going to start all over again in January, mm-hmm. but 
still, we're going to start from a much better position because we've backed them into a corner. Right. You know, I wonder, you know, as health coaching matures, if we're going to start to see more, um, and I'd love your opinion about this because to your point, like, unless it's a hospital now, uh, you know, why would you need a license? Now, that being said, my, I mean, my mom spent over a month in a, in a hospital, a couple of hospitals, she was moved around. And I get that the dietitians are there to build the meals that people receive, which by the way, the shit they fed my mom, I would never in a million years feed her. They're supposed to, they're supposed to craft meals based on a doctor's orders right? for, for a medical patient who has a diagnosed medical condition or disease. And this is yeah. part of the treatment plan. Right. So, yeah. so they do that. And I, I could see that. And, and I could see why yeah. the need for a license, even though I may disagree with the end, like, plan because mm-hmm. they gave basically gave my mom boost low fat pudding uh crappy like m- baked mastacholi in a, in a roll you know it, it, whatever only, either here nor there but the fact of the matter is is like the role of a health coach within a hospital setting is still going to be very different than the person yeah. who's designing the meal plan it's sitting down with the patient and talking to them about what they can do to start changing their lifestyle once they leave the hospital? What can we start talking about now behaviorally and habit-wise? How is life going to be different for you when you go home? Let's brainstorm and talk about what you can, what's the one thing you're going to be doing differently as a result of this diagnosis that can Mm -hmm. keep you out of the hospital next time. None of the dietitians do anything like that. They just sort of hand them a guide. My mom got like a diverticulitis guide of like what food she could eat. And that was kind of it. You know what Kelly did for me? Kelly, I, I used to be obsessed with milk. I was <laughs> over a gallon of milk a week. Wow. A lot of milk. I've always mm-hmm. drank milk going back to a toddler. And Kelly said to me one day, she said, honey, do you need it? Do you need milk? Do you want milk? Or do you just, you just have to have milk? Why are you drinking milk? Because it's sugar. Mm-hmm. And until she actually said, honey, lactose, <laughs> <it's> sugar. <laughs> Until she told me that, until she challenged me of like, why are you drinking the milk? Is it just right. you want it, you have to have it, or you need it? Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't need it. I don't have to have it. I just kind of like it. Once she nailed that into me, right. I started drinking a heck of a lot less milk. She pulled it out of you. She didn't nail it into you. She pulled it out of you. She yeah. didn't tell you, Jonathan, stop drinking that. milk. Yeah. And, and so earlier this year, early the, earlier this year, I started thinking about sugar more in my diet because we're all pandemic. We're all locked down at home and I'm, I'm having to learn to cook more. And so I started thinking about sugar and there's, um, there's a great program called the restart program, uh, which teaches people about, uh, which is a, a training system for practitioners to go and then do large group trainings of, uh, specifically focused on things like sugar detox. Mm-hmm. And Oh my God, a sugar detox is the worst, but after four or five months of reducing my sugar intake and, and just ugh, taking in sugar-free drinks and everything, I'm now down to drinking something like this, which is cherry limeade naturally flavored sparkling water with zero sugar. Nice. Well done. Anybody who knows me personally, sugar-free, I even, it even got so crazy that I, I stopped drinking Coca-Cola. I'm from Georgia after all, and that's just, you know, I was weaned on it, but <laughs> I started drinking Diet Coke. Yeah. I was like, why am I drinking Diet Coke? I can't believe this actually tastes good. Well, it tastes good because I hadn't been consuming large, massive amounts of sugar right. for so long. It's so practicing. yeah, and it's just, it's that little bit of handholding where a dietitian can tell me, Jonathan, you need to take in less sugar. Here's some meal plan. But it was a holistic practitioner who was like, hey, let's think about this in real world terms. Yeah. And that's figure out some alternative foods that you can eat. Let's come up with some recipes that reduce the sugar. Exactly. Let's talk about what are you eating and why do you eat it? Yeah. Um, and it's just, it just you know, you, you get into a relationship and you gain weight. I lost 50 pounds dating her. Uh, <laughs> she's an incredible practitioner uh, in that regards. I think, I, I think that part of the disconnect is that, well, maybe the part of the disconnect is that dietitians don't know what health coaching is. Right. Right. Like I, yeah. I don't yeah. want to tell my clients what to eat. I want to support them in making their own food decisions mm-hmm. and from a place of information and education. Right. I, I 
don't want to give them a meal plan. I don't want to give them a number of grams of sugar to reach for. I want, just like your girlfriend did, tease this intrinsic motivation out of the client and then give them some structural environmental support so that they can implement. Empowerment, you know, dietitians, bless their heart, they desperately want to be seen as medical doctors. Yeah. Yeah. They want to stand on par with medical doctors Mm -hmm. and they want to be like in Ohio. Ohio is the heads, hands down, the worst state in the country to practice it because not only is it, is a license required, but they are vicious in going after people. And if you, you can be punished by up to a year in prison what? and a massive fine for talking about, for just telling someone to eat less sugar and more vegetables, you've committed a crime. And it's just like, why? You know, they, I remember talking to a legislator's, a legislator's staff in Ohio and she has Crohn's disease. And she's like, wait a second, wait a second. Is this why my doctor keeps trying to refer me to a dietitian? I was like, yes, because under the law of Ohio, it's illegal for him to talk to you about food and nutrition. Oh, just before we talked to you, Jonathan, we spoke to a registered dietitian today. It's just kind of how the podcast schedule un- unfolded today, this week. <laughs> but, you know, and she was, and so she she's a dietitian that also became a health coach. So she's kind of doing both things and she had a really interesting story. But what she was saying is like, Dietitians are great for somebody in like late stage kidney disease or managing yeah. through disease states with where you are kind of like quasi doctor ish. You're, you're definitely part of the disease management. They are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And we, in that interview, we talked about the illness wellness continuum. So I can bring it up again, but it's like, please, if, if, if you're ill, if you're di- if, have a diagnosed disease state, I want you to work with your licensed medical practitioners to get you to some semblance of health. I have a client right now who's got Crohn's disease and she worked with her doctor and medications and dietitians to get her to a place where she could manage her symptoms. Mm-hmm. And now she's working with me to get her to like wellness, right? With where she has a goal of getting off this medication. It's like, great, that's out of my wheelhouse. You keep your doctor close on that, but we're just going to work on supporting your gut from here on out, you know, you made great strides in mm-hmm. putting your Crohn's into remission. I'm not going to touch your Crohn's. I'm just going to help support your gut. Right. It, like that's the, that's the integrative model. And it can be a really beautiful thing for somebody with the, with the, who has a diagnosed disease state and then moves to health mm-hmm. and then wants to go from health to like awesome wellness. That's where we come in. Yeah. There's a place for us all. And there's yes. enough sick people out there, not sick. That's the wrong word. There's enough people like myself who spend a lot of time working, don't have a lot of time to think about food, never have thought about food and nutrition, just it's warm eat. And there's just a lot of us out here who need that interpersonal empowerment Mm -hmm. that a dietitian's not trained for and a dietitian's not really set out to do. Right. I don't expect, I would never expect a dietitian to sit with me on Zoom like this, talking about why did I eat those Oreo cookies? Mm -hmm. You know, I ate a whole pack of Oreo cookies. Why would you- Because they were in the house. They were in the house and I was (laughs) bored or it was cold or or, or whatever, you know, it's it's, not gonna do that. that would, be, that would be a waste of their, like, literally, I've had that conversation. Okay, they're in the house. Why were in the house? I put them in the shopping cart. Why'd you put them in the shopping cart? Exactly. Why? Like, a dietitian doesn't want to go to school for four years and do, a, like, a 10,000 or whatever hour internship to talk about why the Oreo cookies ended up in the shopping cart. But I love talking about that. That's my favorite stuff to talk about. Yeah. And, and, and that, 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 at the end of the day, is what makes people successful. You know, yeah. you, you said something like, I, I don't know if six is the right word. I, I would actually say that it is the right word. I mean, the, statistically speaking, 80, only 12% of the U.S. population is metabolically healthy. It's crazy. 12% could actually say they're metabolically healthy, which means 88%, do the math, is metabolically unwell. They may be subclinical. They might not have been outright diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, yes. but something metabolically is funky. They, you know, and so I would say from a health coach perspective, if we can catch some of those people that are quote unquote at risk, before they ever become quote unquote, actually sick and diagnosed and start talking, having these behavioral conversations about choices to Aaron's point, why were the Oreos in the cart? Well, I have kids like that explains everything. (laughs) Okay. So are the kids, are the Oreos any, what is it about Oreos and kids that makes having the Oreos in the cart like a thing? 
Yeah, well, my kids like Oreos. So you have to just unpack this. What's that? Put it on a list, you know, right. and, and if it was it on a list and why did you put it on the list? Well, it was exactly. just another food item I thought I could should get. Oh, yeah. You know, the yeah. health coaches will make the list for you. Yeah. Um, well, we don't let our clients get away with with that. Like we just, yeah. we get into the granulars of decision-making and pattern right. interruption, you know, and, and, and I think actually to what you were saying, Laura, just a second ago, like one of, part of my origin story is that I was diagnosed pre-diabetic, which is mm -hmm. subclinically diabetic. I'm not actually diabetic. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. you're kind of getting there. So, so I guess my, I guess my option was to wait until that became diabetes and then get hooked up with a dietitian who put me on some diabetes eating plan. But instead I went to the bookstore and learned about diabetes and fixed myself. Uh, and that nobody, nobody handcuffed me and arrested me <laughs> for fixing my own diabetes. That was actually cut, probably the desired outcome. This way we had yeah. so for a year, for a couple of years, we were fighting the American association of diabetes educators. And mm. they have been trying to pass a law that says you have to have a license to talk about diabetes. And they've succeeded in Kentucky. So in Kentucky, you have to have a law to talk about diabetes management. Uh, but they tried for many years in Florida to require a license to talk about diabetes, talk about diabetes management. Um, where there's money to be made and there's a trade association behind it, it's only a matter of time before you know you have they start forcing someone to pay. And you know if I if I could touch on one subject, mm -hmm. there's a very similar parallel we have here. So the the National Health and Wellness Consortium, what is it called these days? NWC. Yeah, they're a national board now. National yeah. board for health and wellness yeah. coaching. So I'm very I'm very concerned about that board. That board raises red flags for me. Uh, it's not that I'm against a board certification for health coaches, and it's not that I'm against organizations of health coaches, but they were purchased by the National Board of Medical Examiners, which is an, which is an allopathic group with about $200 million a, a year in budget. And what I'm concerned about is that at some point, 10 years from now, I think we're going to start seeing health coaches go, why do I have an NWCHC board certification? Why am I continuing to pay for this? What good is it doing me? I've got, you know, 150 clients. I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. At some point, they're going to have to find a way to add value. And they've been trying to do it with insurance, but there is no way in hell, and I use that word very carefully, that the allopathic community is ever going to let health coaches bill for insurance if they can help it. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we actually talked about that with, we haven't, that episode hasn't gone live yet, but um we had uh, Leanne on to kind of talk about it. And, and she, we had a very honest conversation and she said, you know, look, if somebody just wants to be an independent private practice kind of health coach, then they likely may not need to go that road. She said that, you know, she said really where this is going to um, really be a value is for folks that want to work clinically, right? You know how right now there seems to be this barrier for health coaches that want to work clinically because they're associated with the medical board examiners or, you know, mm -hmm. that this will create a pathway for health coaches that want to work clinically yeah. so that those that cannot afford to pay for their own health coaching care can go to a clinical practitioner who can bill and they can kind of get some health coaching. And she did have one instance. She said, you know, if you're an independent coach, but you want to work with large corporations, really dig into corporate wellness. You may see some of these larger employers mm -hmm. look for something like that. I, I'm, I don't mean to be negative. Let me be clear. No, I, I hear you. Yeah. About them. I think what they're doing is good. They're bringing order and they're bringing standards to the community. But they, they, they've got me over here kind of giving them the old hairy eyeball thinking, where are you going with this? Well, let's be watchful. And all the more reason, even for brand new health coaches, that even if it's just 10 bucks a month that you're setting aside to contribute to something like that right there, 10 bucks a month would be $120 a year right? From every practitioner to help make sure that there's an organization there that has our best interest at heart. And we can keep all these other organizations like NBHWC, which Aaron and I, I don't know about, I shouldn't speak for Aaron, but I, now <laughs> I know them well enough that I feel what they're doing is coming from a really great place from it, from, from good intentions. Um, so, so I, I definitely get that. But at the same time, I agree like that, like anything else, there needs to be checks and balances on like what kind of power comes from there and um, yeah. making sure that the practitioners are empowered 
and that the end consumer is protected and have freedom of choice. Insurance is a big deal Mm -hmm. for a lot of people who would love to bill for insurance. Here's the short and skinny on insurance. You can't. And the reason you can't is because insurance companies base their reimbursement policies on state Medicare and Medicaid services Mm -hmm. and state Medicaid and Medicare services base their services on federal Center for Medicaid and Medicare services. The federal rules say that in order to bill to Medicare, you must be a licensed healthcare practitioner. Right. So the states have followed with that. That's why the dietitians desperately want to be licensed because then they can get that whole $25 from insurance. And in some states, it's actually been okay. So like the dietitians of Pennsylvania, I don't care that they want a license. I don't care if they have a license. Mm -hmm. They can have a license that does anything. I don't care. Just don't let, just don't prevent the rest of us from working. The people right. don't want the license. So what the NWCHC did is they convinced, um, they got a C, what's called a CPT, CPT3 code. Mm-hmm. It's a tracking code. It's a code that for medical billing coding to track health and wellness coaching. And their goal is that after five or 10 years, once they've collected this data that shows that, yes, there are health and wellness coaches mm-hmm. acting out there, they, they are under the, someone has convinced them that they can move that up to CPT two or one and actually get insurance billing. And really the avenue that we should be taking, it's one we are taking, is go to the insurance companies directly. Mm-hmm. A lot of these insurance companies and especially the corporate wellness plans mm-hmm. have a, a wellness component built into it. Right. You know, so for example, Garmin the company Garmin, Mm -hmm. they have a corporate wellness policy and they give you so much money of your insurance where you can go spend on anyone you want. Yoga, physical fitness, soccer, anybody, health coach, Mm -hmm. anybody. That is really where it's going because the insurance companies are are very interested in wellness and reducing the the instances of billable care. Right, like the health savings account model. Exactly, so there's legislation right now in the federal government but it's that there is an HSA bill that would say, yeah, you can use part of your HSA savings for, for health and wellness coaching uh, services. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the future is to go directly yeah. to Blue Cross Blue Shield mm-hmm. and, and work with them directly. Don't wait for the government to do it. Do you think, you think that individual health coaches could do that? Yes, or- absolutely. Oh, okay. Call, I mean, what's stopping you? Call up the insurance company, especially, especially if the insurance is paid for by the, by the work. Right. You know, Get your client to bring in the insurance policy and look over it with them. It exists. And even then, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, that's a big one. That's one yeah. that if you can get someone on the phone, you've reached a miracle. But some of the other, I don't want to say lower tier, but more mass, more for the masses like Cigna mm-hmm. and Kaiser Permanente uh, and some of the smaller insurance companies. Are, are instituting wellness policies to try to bring down the, the amount of money that they are spending. Right. Yeah. I think they're going to have to. You know, obviously things are different where I live, but I had an HSA years ago and I could use it literally on anything I wanted. If I wanted to go buy a bike, I could use it for that. If I wanted to buy a new saddle for my horse, I could put yep. that under my HSA. If I was moving around and I felt like it was going to contribute to my health, I got to make that call. It was like my money to spend. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that's the future. So yeah kind of to bottle this and I guess close the loop on it. So I don't, I'm, and again, forgive me, I'm kind of suffering under COVID exposure. So my mind might be working a little weird. <laughs> Please forgive me. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, dietitians are wonderful people. I mean, yeah. no disrespect to them. They're amazing people. And they do amazing work. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is not and they are not doing good work and they are not doing good for our society. And so it is these institutions that are entrenched that most worry me. So, but again, I'm, I'm paid not to, I'm, be, I'm paid to be pessimistic. So that's, <laughs> that's your role. That's what you're here for. And it's, it's what, uh, the reason why schools like ours help pay to support you. And it's why I think anyone that goes into health coaching mm. on a personal level should consider this part of the cost of doing business. Because you're not going to have the time. Most of us don't have your knowledge, your experience, your connections, but we've got five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month, right? Instead of going to Starbucks one day, it's, it's, you know, 
throw some money to the holistic council because they're here to protect your ability to practice. I heard there was an article that came out recently and I, I, I think it was in the Atlantic and it was something like, don't ask nonprofits to explain what they're doing with your money. <laughs> and I thought, I thought about it for a second. I said, okay, if someone, if someone called me up and said, okay, you, for example, Laura or Aaron called me and says, okay, John, we give you a, we give you X amount of dollars a year. What did you do with that? Right. I can give you chapter and verse of what I did with that. Nice. Uh, I can show you that our action alert system, for example, costs 5,000, no, $6,000 a year. That action alert system allows us to send out these blast emails and allow you to reach your legislator. That is mm -hmm. a fixed cost that I have to pay each year. I can show you that you can look at our 990. I don't make much money. And I'm, and I'm fine with that because for me, this is a more of a passionate thing. But I can show you where all the dollars and cents are going. And I think any nonprofit should be able to do that. And they should be able to go, yeah, 10 bucks a month. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do with that 10 bucks a month. I'm going to keep the lights on. I'm going to keep it in my fund in case I have to get in the car and drive to Harrisburg. Because I did. I've had to go to Harrisburg three times this year. Mm -hmm. Last year, I had to go to Florida four times. Uh, it's not cheap. To, I had to go, oh, gosh. I had to go to North Dakota, Missouri, Florida. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Missouri is a fun place. Don't ever go to don't don't go to Jefferson City, Missouri. You won't find be a, <laughs> Can I tell a story real quick? Sure. Real quick. So Missouri, there is a group of ladies in Missouri who are doing a fantastic job uh, uh, in, in in keeping legislation alive and pushing the legislators to change the law. There, they're doing a great job. The first time I landed in Jefferson City was when I my legislation was introduced, and I developed a fever. I had like a fever of 102. I was feeling oh absolutely miserable. For some reason, I could not find an urgent care to save my life. I had all these holistic practitioners. And when they found out I was sick, <laughs> they, they started like, okay, we have to, here, here's the supplement you need to take. Some <laughs> vitamin D, here's some vitamin C. Do you need some food? <laughs> You're well taken care of. Yeah. I'm well taken care of. This community has been far too kind to me in taking care of me. Well, so tell us a little bit. So something new that also came about this year is um, that you started um, a foundation, yes, right? A charitable yes. foundation. So tell us a little bit about that foundation and how it um, is associated with the council. Yeah. So quite frankly, the so I, I started the Foundation for Holistic Health Educators, and it is an organization that is intended to educate the masses about what is holistic health, how does holistic health work? Who are the practitioners? What are their education and training? What are the schools that are out there? How many practitioners are out there? Answering these research questions. Mm -hmm. And the problem I had was that I always intended to do this for the council side, but the council is a C4. Money donated to the C4 is not tax deductible. Mm -hmm. And so that really limits the, the amount of money we can put behind these big research projects. I need to hire... I don't have time, I'm lobbying. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly lobbying and doing stuff. So I need to hire someone whose job is to research how many practitioners are there in America? How many health coaches are there really? Yeah. So when I go to a state like Florida and I say to them, there are 5,000 holistic practitioners in this state, I have evidence to back it up. You know, So I created the, the foundation because it's a C3 tax deductible nonprofit. And that means that when you donate to it, you can take it off your taxes. But it also means that that money can only be used for educational purposes, can't be used for lobbying. That's kind of how the law works. Mm -hmm. So I started the foundation with a lot of ideas in mind, but really it's a fundraising vehicle. Mm -hmm. I'll be quite frank. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know me, Laura, I'm not someone who ever beats around the bush. I like to be very direct with this stuff. It's a fundraising mechanism. It is the exact same thing as the American Cancer Foundation, Greenpeace Foundation, um, Scoliosis Foundation. It is intended to raise money so we can put money behind the complex education. Okay. And I, I, I would prefer that if you're interested in donating to the council, to our work, donate to the foundation. Mm -hmm. Because starting next year, I want to take $5,000 and hire a researcher to say, okay, who are the holistic health schools in America? Who are mm -hmm. they? Everybody from the letter A all the way down to primal. 
what is their program? What is a comparison chart of their program? What are they teaching? What is their boards? All of that stuff. Yeah. Because that will be useful, not only to people interested in entering the profession, mm -hmm. but when I go to a legislator and I say, we do not diagnose, treat, or cure diseases. We right. teach our practitioners this, this, and this. I can actually right. show that to them. Yeah. And, and so I, it just became a problem. I didn't have the time to do it. I need to hire someone to do it. But I, I hate asking our community for money. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds terrible, leading a nonprofit, but I hate asking our practitioners to donate because they often don't have it. Right. You know, and they're already spending enough money on a business license and additional trainings and CEUs and office space or God knows what else. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's only so many of the schools out there. There's right. only so much the schools can give. So we have this foundation. And my goal is that starting next year, oh, this is a good opportunity. We're going to have a contest. <laughs> the foundation needs a logo. Oh. So we're going to have a contest where we're going to give a small grant to a holistic practitioner to come up with a logo. It could be whatever you want, anything. We're looking for a logo. You know, there's an opportunity to showcase a practitioner who's going to create the logo for an organization, and we can then write a blog post about her, or him or her, excuse me, there, we do have some men, write a blog post about them to showcase, and then that's something I can then use in my lobby. Yeah. You know, I want to hire someone to do um, an economic analysis of what is the income potential. That's a question I get all the time. All the time. And what, the time. Do you, what do you show them? How do you show them? You don't. So when I was, I did some rough math in New Jersey, right? New Jersey is a state that up until next year has no law restricting anybody's ability to practice. And they still won't because I made them sell the farm. Uh, and, and our exemption is like this long. And, and it's basically like, screw you guys. We're fine. We don't need you. Uh, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. But in the state of New Jersey, I started doing kind of back in the envelope numbers. And I said, all right, we've got maybe 4,000 people, four or 5,000 practitioners. If we've got four or 5,000 practitioners and each of them is earning, pick a point, 45,000 a year, pick a random point. That's a significant amount of tax revenue that the state is endangering mm -hmm. by putting these people out of business. I've got, I know I have at least 5,000 practitioners in Ohio that desperately want to work, but they can't. That's 5,000 people not in the workforce, 5,000 people not working up to their education and training, 5,000 people not contributing income tax. Right, right. Oh, good point. So being able to do that research and hire statisticians, researchers to do that work um, is invaluable because it yeah. really helps me on the lobbying side. So if you're interested in donating and you're interested in supporting, I really need your support, especially this year. It's been very hard with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, www.fhhe.org, Foundation for Holistic Health Educators. It's a C3, it's tax deductible. Um, I give you a good point. Chris Cresser. Do you know Chris? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chris Cresser. So Chris Cresser is a member of the council, but his practice has changed a little bit where he, his schooling has changed a little bit where he's working predominantly with licensed healthcare practitioners now. Okay. So he doesn't really need the support that the council provides, but he still wants to support us. So he's giving to the foundation. Okay. And I'm like, thank you, Chris. <laughs> I was like, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, well, I, as a, as a holistic health practitioner, I like, um, I, like, I don't, I like donating to uh, causes that are going to help me. I like donating to organizations or not or donating to them or becoming members of or whatever. Like, I like spending my dollars that way. And it doesn't have to be a big expenditure. Like, mm -hmm. I get it. A lot of people are. $25. I got people who give me five bucks a month. Yeah. And I am extraordinarily happy. That adds up. Yeah. No doubt. Our website, you know, having a website, I'd love to redesign our website someday. Mm -hmm. Um and there's just, there's a lot of things that the little donations yeah. really help. Um, uh, let's see, I had, I'll tell you a great example. In 2017, it was late 2017, I had no money in the bank. I was flat broke. And I was sitting in front of a cafe and I thought I was going to get a bagel because that's all I could afford. And then I suddenly got a donation for $25. And I was the happiest man on earth because I had lunch that day. <laughs> So 
really, it does help. Yeah. It helps a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Getting on Amtrak to go up to, go up to New Jersey, that's 100, 100, 150 bucks a pop. Mm -hmm. uh, those little tiny things, things work. And so, yeah, it's a labor of love. I'm not, I, I don't want to come across as complaining about money because I'm doing quite fine. Uh, I've got 58 typewriters for heaven's sakes. Okay, that's fhhe.org. That's the foundation. That's the foundation. And then holisticcouncil.org uh, is the actual council. Uh, and if you go to that website, you'll find some wonderful information on the laws mm -hmm. uh, of the various states yep. and what you can and what you, what you can do in addition to what you cannot do. Uh, I'm actually kind of heartened. I found out the other day that there's another organization out there that actually just scraped our entire website oh. and, and, is, and is offering it to their students or, or their, their members. Okay. Uh, so wow. it's kind of funny. I guess imitation is the best form of flattery. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, we uh, we have a lesson in our course that it, that encourages students to go to your website and understand the legislation where they live, like as much as they can reach out to you because we are a member school and they can reach out to you. It's like but also, yeah, also do your due diligence and really understand. Like it's not all doomsday. If you can sift through it and figure it out, that's going to be wonderful. Here's another one. There's a, there's a website, there's a company called Calend, Calendly. Yep. Calendly. So yep. our Calendly account is like, what, 10 bucks a month mm -hmm. in, in order. But what that lets me do is, is that 10 bucks a month allows people to just schedule a call exactly. with me. And because I'm running two organizations, plus sometimes my private life, uh, <laughs> having that Calendly. So if you go to, if you go to, um, if you go, so I'm going to edit it right, right here. So if you ever want to talk to me, just go to calendly.com slash Jonathan Posey, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-P-O-S-E-Y and schedule a time. And I will be happy to talk with you. And if it takes 30 minutes to two hours, uh, I will talk with you as much as I possibly can and help you to understand your state's law. And I tell this to all the schools and I'm very serious about it. I don't advocate for one school over the other. Right. I'm never going to sell you a bad bill of goods. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is, and I'm going to help you find a pathway forward. Because the last thing I want is for one of our graduates to come out of their school and go, I just spent all that money for nothing. Right. And I hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a labor awesome. of life. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Yes. Thank you very much for your time and your passion for helping all of us out here who are all just out there trying to help other people. Um, we don't want to get sued over it. Or... <laughs> if you, as a member, so another benefit of being a student or graduate of one of our member schools is that let's say someone does come after you. Let's say if you were in America, Aaron, unfortunately, I don't know anyone in Canada who can do this. Let's say you were here in America and you got that email. Mm -hmm. I can connect you with a pro bono attorney who will help you. You know, that's, that's, awesome. that's one of the things that I have figured out that I can do. Yeah, right. um, if you need liability insurance, I can connect you with reputable companies who provide good liability insurance okay. for a rate. People always ask about that. They do. Yep. So we get that a lot. I'm a resource and, and, I, and I do love what I do. You can tell. Thank you. you. Even, though I'm, even though it feels like I'm, I'm sitting under a wet blanket and I can't quite hear everything you guys are saying because I'm getting <laughs> clogged, but I'm here. I'm good. <laughs> oh my gosh. Go get some rest, Jonathan. Rest up. I hope you're well. I hope it's not COVID, but if it is, I hope you'll be fine. Rest up. Lots of fluids. Um, and, th and thank you for joining us despite feeling pretty crummy right about now. We yeah, appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very, very much. It, it helps to get exposure and for people to find out that, that mm -hmm. I'm here. And even if you don't go to one of our schools, call me anyways. Maybe I can answer a few questions. Um, but I'm probably going to say, Hey, can we talk to your school? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. It, it, Absolutely. It, yeah. So yeah. Thank you. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Laura, uh, blah, blah, Laura, excuse me. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's so wonderful to see you. Awesome. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.
Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 Certification Course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach Certification Course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change, goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again. Your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills and maybe dial up your credential and become a board eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's Level 2 program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level 2. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board certified coach, book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844 307 7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.